Hello and welcome to Data Center Hawks 3Q 2021 Data Center Industry Trends Updates. I'm Mike Netzer, joined by Data Center Hawk founder and CEO, David Liggett. David, I know you and the team have been hard at work, so excited to hear about some of the highlights from Q3. Yeah, thank you, Mike. As always, great to be with you, and thanks so much for all that have joined today. All right, if you're not familiar, we track the data center industry as a segment of commercial real estate for markets in North America, Europe, and Asia Pacific. So every quarter, David and his team uh, conduct hundreds of interviews, survey every facility in the market, and then take a snapshot of that data. And then by comparing that snapshot to previous quarters, you can get an understanding of market dynamics like commission power growth, absorption, vacancy, co-location lease pricing, et cetera. So we just completed all of our research for Q3 2021. Yes. And so we're doing this broadcast live to get you the information as quickly as possible. We'll also be publishing a summary blog later this week, so be on the lookout for that on datacenterhawk.com. Since this is live, if you have any questions, you can post them uh, in the chat and we'll answer them at the end. And then lastly, if you're watching this and we haven't met yet, we'd love to connect. There's a link below to schedule some time with our team. Uh, you can always go on datacenterhawk.com and request a demo. All right, David, so without any further ado, Q3 2021. Yes. What are the big takeaways? Yeah, you bet. Thanks, Mike. Uh, you know, I think there were a couple things that I'd like to highlight at a macro level, and then we're actually going to jump into some different regions and talk about some of the things that we've seen. But, you know, first I'd say there's some unique dynamics playing out right now with data center industry supply and demand. And if you work in the industry, which obviously most of the people probably on this LinkedIn live do, you know what I'm talking about. You know, one thing I would mention from a demand standpoint is the a uh, demand from the hyperscale user market uh, continues to grow, and it really can create a lumpy demand environment at times. Uh, but this is reality, you know. So there's times that we see high levels of absorption in a market, and then the next time period, it's it's a bit less, uh, and sometimes significantly less. Uh, the other thing I would mention from a demand standpoint is we've really seen an increase in enterprise data center activity. So requirements from financial, technology, insurance companies, really across global markets, that's returned. We'll talk a little bit about that um, a little bit later. And then, you know, at the beginning of this year, we did another podcast. So if you listen to our stuff, you might have heard us say, uh, you know, at the, at the beginning of 2021, we thought this would be a really strong year, maybe not as strong as 2020. Uh, but I think we're starting to really see that that play out. We are seeing strength certainly in the third quarter we're hearing about increased opportunities and requirements in the fourth quarter uh, so that's what we're seeing from a demand standpoint uh, on the supply side here are a, a few of the focal points that we're hearing certainly land acquisition uh, you know we're seeing this play out in north america europe asia pac uh, a focus on supply chain management so i think every data center operator out there that's uh, you know, building facilities is focused on this. And then also capital allocation wisdom. You know, where do we spend our capital and how do we do it wisely? And, and then the last thing I would just say from a macro perspective is that timing will be more important, like the timing of delivery of facilities, the timing of capacity, those type of, of uh, timelines will be uh, more and more important as, as the year goes on. Okay. Well, let's take a look at a specific region. You know, you've said many times that one of the quickest ways to change the dynamics of a data center market is with a, some type of government action, regulation, yes. policy, et cetera. So specifically in APAC, I think we see this playing out very poignantly. Sure. So let's talk about some of the markets there and how that is impacting supply and demand. Yeah, so I'll hit a couple of these and highlight some of the trends that we're seeing. Let's start with, with Singapore. In fact, I know there are some people uh, from Singapore on this call right now, so we, we appreciate it. That's yes. right. Uh, but, you know, Singapore is, is one of the largest APAC markets, 655 megawatts of commission power on the multi-tenant side. Uh, you know, there's been an unofficial moratorium in place on data center development as the area works through really how to grow a footprint in an economic or an environmentally friendly well way. So Singapore has a very low vacancy rate right now. The other thing I'd mention is there's still uh, some heavy demand looking in that market and trying to figure out where to go. Um, one of the uh, results from where the market is right now is there's been increased pricing. So the pricing that's, you know, been out there for retail requirements, wholesale requirements, et cetera, has been higher. Uh, and there's a smaller amount of development activity taking place, but that's a market that certainly has the eyes of the international community and, and there's large users trying to figure out how to grow their footprint there. Uh, if we flip over to a market like Hong Kong, you know, that's a bit smaller, 504 megawatts of commission power, but it certainly is attractive if you think about uh, Hong Kong as an international global business market, uh, the population size there, 
Uh, you know, and I think one of the challenges there is just how the development market works through some of the challenges around the data privacy. And, you know, these are not just um, issues for an area like Hong Kong, it's, it's issues in a lot of places around, you know, regulatory environments and, and data privacy. Uh, but it's clear that development's taking place there. And, and so the question mark will be, how does that uh, impact things moving forward? Uh, and then if I you know jump over to Sydney, so smaller market, 353 megawatts of commission power. That's not small by any means, but in comparison, um, you know, and, and the tone in that market's been a bit different. You know, the government's created a uh, pathway to to growth for data center developments, uh, and so it's one of the reasons we've seen an increased level of construction uh, in a market like Sydney. I, I think we're seeing a maturation of some of these markets go on, and and a lot of times too as hyperscale. Uh, users are trying to uh, mature their footprint. You know, th these are the places where some of that's happening. And it's reasons why companies like Digital Realty, Air Trunk, Macquarie, Next DC are active from a construction perspective. And then also just yesterday, Equinix announced a joint venture with Prudential to build two X scale facilities. These are facilities aimed at attracting hyperscale demand, so a little different than how Equinix typically uh, approaches the market. And, um, you know, it's, it's this type of activity that's really growing things like from a Sydney perspective. So all in all, a lot happening in Asia. Um, I think with some of the things you mentioned, it will be really interesting to see over the next 12 months how these um, micro uh, trends impact development moving forward. Yeah, it almost seems like these markets are almost like an adolescent. Right, there's there's some maturation that has happened, but there's like almost like a growth spurt happening. And is, 100%. if you have teenagers, you know there can be some awkward phases through that, <laughs> uh, and do. hopefully and becomes a uh, you know healthy growth at some point. But all right, a lot to keep an eye on in APAC. Thank you. Um, pivoting then over to European side, you know, on specifically talking about the under construction, the, the really the growth piece. That's what I think we're focused most heavily on because yeah. that's the part that uh, the most interesting dynamic for people in the space. Yeah. So talk about how that, what's that looking like in kind of the primary and secondary markets in yeah. Europe. Uh, I think from a demand perspective, uh, you know, we're at least understanding that that large and like small that enterprise uh, group is, you know, really active trying to figure out where to go and where to be. Um, you know, pre-leasing is something that we've seen increase in, you know, the big five markets for sure, as well as secondary European markets because of demand needs of large companies and the delivery timelines as well. Um, I think there are certainly some uh, challenges moving forward around like power cost uncertainty. Um, you know, sometimes the perception of, you know, d data center users like certainty. They like to know the environment that they're in. So when there's uncertainty, there can just be question marks on what will it be? You know, if, if you're new to the data center industry, power costs is obviously a significant portion of, uh, of what uh, drives the, the, the total cost of a project. And so that's something to definitely keep in, I think, perspective. Um, I don't think it will like kill data center development in any of those areas. You know, it's really been interesting to watch as we, you know, launched coverage on these markets, you know, two to three years ago, how much growth there has been mm. uh, and how much th these real estate markets are traditionally tight too. So there's not a lot of, there's not like, like land sites just sitting out there available for data center development. So uh, it's one of the reasons we've seen that pre-leasing um, you know, trend really spike in Europe. Yeah, and if you contrast that with some of those APAC markets, like the, some of those larger European markets have shown sustained growth over time is where some of the APAC markets are still kind of up and down, lumpy yeah. from quarter to quarter. Sure. And some of that's as a result of, as we've seen, the government policy, et cetera, and they just haven't found the supply-demand balance yet. Right, and some of it, you know, is just around the maturing data center markets. And the more data center operators are there, the more options are there. And, and I would say this, you know, data center operators are building more efficiently today and in a scalable uh, format uh, that, that is able to meet some of these like bigger demand needs. And that has totally changed the market. Um, so that's been a really interesting thing to see. If you think about, uh, I want to hit on maybe two markets in Europe very quickly, and then we can jump to the next topic. But, you know, London is obviously one of Europe's largest data center markets. Uh, we've seen the vacancy rate in that market really decrease over the last 12 months. It now sits at 9.5%. Uh, in the third quarter, we saw multiple providers uh, get permits for new developments, which just comes to, to show you that the, the forecast and outlook is that you know, bigger demand will continue to come uh, to the London market. And you know, while we've seen like re-upping 
of commitments to areas like Slough, which is you know a very um, popular data center area from a development standpoint. Uh, we've also seen other areas that have really started to emerge as uh, geographic locations that could receive some of these uh, projects like Swindon, Milton, uh, Buckinghamshire. So, you know, these these areas that, that aren't necessarily in the more traditional data center markets. And that's a trend that we're seeing in the U.S. too, which we'll talk about here in a minute. Uh, but at, watching that data center development move geographically in a market is, is really interesting. Uh, you know, the other thing I've just mentioned, the other market I'd mentioned is Frankfurt, which has quickly become one of the largest data center markets in Europe as well. Um, we've seen like sustained growth in that market for multiple time periods now. Uh, and, you know, if you think about Frankfurt, the financial hub of Germany, um, and, you know, some of the, the tight, the, the, the fact that the real estate market is very tight there uh, has increased that pre-leasing trend that we've talked about. And that is something that has, has changed that market. I mean, it is, you know, very hard to find large amounts of capacity in Frankfurt because of, of those things. So, um, you know, if you take a look at just the, the large five data center markets in Europe, you know, the, the absorption has continued to, to grow and, and be very strong in these markets. And we, we think it will, will continue to be. Now, watching some of the things we talked about at the beginning will, will impact that. Um, but, you know, market growth in, certainly in Europe has, um, you know, has continued to uh, be very interesting to watch and, and will be for the foreseeable future. Hey, David, I have a fun fact for you. Do you, oh, know, I love fun do you know what they call a data center in Frankfurt? What? It's a Reckonzentrum. There we go. No surprise there. Four-syllable right. word. The Germans dubbed their four-syllable words. That's right. Hey, the other, the other thing I would mention on as, as you think about European data center markets is there's a lot of activity in secondary data center markets mm -hmm. as well there. So, you know, because there's certain regulatory uh, challenges with uh, market growth beyond a certain point or there's um you know data privacy uh things to focus on you know we have seen some pretty unique growth in secondary markets and i think that's a trend that you'll continue to see as these large hyperscale companies really look to mature their footprint yeah and that that push from kind of primary out to secondary you mentioned it being the u.s as well you know one of the things again you've said many times is trends happen in the in north america and then they happen over in europe like on a three to five year delay. yeah sure but, you know, you mentioned some of the power cost issues, et cetera, for, on the European side. We're seeing those now on the U.S. side. So it's almost like a reverse trend yeah. for some of those things that we're seeing in Europe. Yeah, Talk a little about that as we yeah. kind of transition to North America. Here. Yeah, there's so, so when you think about North America, there are some interesting things taking place. Um, you know, there are, uh, I think, more of a focus on, like, the uh, resources that data center development takes. So if you think about power, <laughs> water, um, when you go into a market, for new projects, you know, historically, uh, as the data center market in North America has grown, most uh, geographies or communities have been pretty accepting and welcoming to data center projects. We've seen a few, maybe the the, the tone and public sentiment change, um, and it's not something that can't be overcome. In fact, it's one of the reasons that we do what we do, and others are working to educate what, like, the value of uh, you know this data center industry and how it can change. Uh, an area, but th there are some challenges. You know, one of the other challenges here in the U.S. that we're seeing is, you know, the ability to get large campuses, uh, not just from a, a land site perspective, but also a, you know, long power perspective is, is getting more challenging. And I think you can see that uh, in multiple markets because the demand has, has been so, um, so high. So let me hit on some of the trends we've seen in North America, and, and I'll follow up with some some uh, examples of, of what those trends are. Uh, so, so we've talked about enterprise requirements somewhat returning, and maybe I'll take a second, you know, in 2020, I think the enterprise data center market, and you know, maybe if you think uh, requirement sizes from 500 KW to three to four megawatts, you know those in 2020 were a lot quieter. I think that had to do with certainly the challenges around the pandemic, uh, how those companies had to turn in, like, look inside and say, hey, we've got to get our own company set at home uh, with some of the issues that are going on. And, and these re these requirements maybe took a time out. Those have come back to the market in 2021. And, you know, we really saw the, the activity at the very beginning of the year. And then, you know, a lot of those are like on the goal line. Um, and so that's happening. So I think financial insurance techn technology companies, markets like Chicago, Phoenix, Atlanta, 
Northern Virginia, uh, in a market like Dallas. Uh, so here's an interesting stat. You know, the Dallas vacancy rate in 3Q2020, so a year ago, was, was 15.7%. 3Q2021, a year later, it went from 15.7 to 10.3. So everything's not bigger in Texas. It's getting that's, smaller. That's right. That's the a good thing, thing though. <laughs> but that has to be a good thing. Okay, that's good, good. A good that's point right. to clarify. That's Thank you, That's right. David. For a market like Dallas, that that is a good thing. And I think it certainly has to do with in, increased enterprise demand. Um, and so there's a chance, you know, there's some large blocks of space here that could be basically taken off the market soon. And so I think that's something really interesting to watch. Like I said, it's not just happening in Dallas. It's just an example. There's other markets that that trend is taking place place in. Um, you know, the other thing I would mention, like specifically around like North America is hyperscale data center user re requirements uh, continuing to be a driver. And this is really across multiple markets. But if we highlight Northern Virginia, so this is really you know, the epicenter for a lot of this stuff happening. Uh, there's two things that I would point out in, in Northern Virginia, or two things going on. You know, when we track the market, we look at the multi-tenant data center market. So right now that's, according to our numbers, it's sized at 1,691 megawatts of commission Big, power. Biggest market in the world. That's right. So multi-tenant, that's the multi-tenant market, 1691. So we also uh, size the hyperscale owned and like powered shell hyperscale or, or market. So again, we, we size the, the, the owned powered shell hyperscale market. And that number is 1,737 megawatts. So big takeaway is that that market is just as big as the um, multi-tenant market in Northern Virginia. And guess what? They are both getting bigger. Yeah. Um, and I would know, say the, the velocity of the hyperscale is even more rapid than the velocity yeah. of the multi-tenant. Yeah, you're which right. Is insane. I mean, there is just a lot of activity going on, and those that are on the call from Northern Virginia, you know what I'm talking about because you're right in the middle of a lot of this. But uh, you know, there's very little available supply on the market right now. Uh, we think that the fourth quarter, you know, not just in Northern Virginia but across the the U.S. will be really strong. Uh, we have seen uh, rising land prices. So if you're in Northern Virginia. And you're in Ashburn over time, we have seen that number go up. But if you draw a, you know, a circle around Ashburn and go to areas like Leesburg and um, Manassas and Gainesville and those numbers, that price per acre, that price per land square foot is going up as well. Uh, and I would say like significantly. In fact, we know, I think the numbers like 11 different groups right now looking for additional sites in the market. You, you mentioned this very quickly and yeah. then kind of passed on. You said you expect there to be potentially significant demand, you know, both Northern Virginia and other markets. I think I'd love for you to unpack that a little bit more, just some of the stuff you heard over the last month or so, just talking to people in the industry. Yeah. So, you know, I mean, I think there's, the, you know, pipelines that are growing, you know, and, and these are like multiple megawatt pipelines uh, and, and like, a number of different requirements within that. And so I think, you know, the, what we're hearing is that, you know, those that are serving requirements or have some of these requirements going on, like those numbers are, are growing, which is really interesting to see. Um, and that can change the market very fast, you know, and, and if, if pre-leasing occurs and development sites get taken off of uh, a market, you know, supply inventory, that, that will change the way that some of these markets operate. Um, so again, you know, Northern Virginia, very interesting to see. Uh, and then the last trend I, I'll bring up is that, you know, we're continuing to see like land banking with land acquisition. Uh, you know, this is happening in markets like, you know, Phoenix, Chicago, Northern Virginia, Northern California, uh, and Hillsboro, like in Portland. So this is basically 20 minutes outside of, of Portland. Uh, a couple of interesting facts about that market is, is, it has basically doubled in size from a commission power perspective in the last two years. So, you know, two years ago it was 62 megawatts. It's now 137 megawatts. Uh, that planned power number that we track, uh, so these are like planned data center requirements coming down the road. Yes, we were commonly refer to that as like a harbinger of future growth. That's right. That's, that's doubled as well. Hmm. Um, you know, multiple providers in Portland are like on their second development sites and they're really making progress as it relates to filling those up. So, um, you know, and, and as those data center parcels get taken up, it's harder to find those that can help uh, accommodate the scalable growth. And that's, that's across the, the world. You know, the idea that like you can build a data center anywhere, okay, but it just costs, you know, money and time. But you make a good point about multiple providers on their second <laughs> development site. So not all planned power is created equal. And yes. that some may be- mm, That's a quote. Some may, yeah, some may be, 
36 months out or longer. And but if, if, if your company's already had success within a market, I think it's much more likely that whatever they have planned is going to come online more quickly than uh, maybe some others. Yeah, so no, that's, that's, that's a great point. That's yeah, absolutely. So I think, you know, this is a market where I see and our team sees uh, you know, continual opportunities, both from like a hyperscale and enterprise level, which is pretty unique. Uh, and then and then I think it's a, it's a place where we'll see that land banking trend continue as, as you know, data center operators really try to get ahead of the demand moving forward, which is, you know, that's obviously the key. That's what everybody's trying to figure out. Yeah, so when you look at like, again, kind of zooming out a little bit to North America as a whole, you know, certainly there's some increased demand that we think is coming. Yep. And typically that would, you would think in most industries drive pricing up yeah in our market in our industry that's not always been the case sure. sometimes increased demand drives prices down because of increased competition or a host of other reasons that we've discussed here yep. ad nauseum uh <laughs> but what do you see based on everything you talked about land banking supply and demand hyperscale etc enterprise where do you see lease pricing going the next six to 12 months yeah i mean it, it's certainly reasonable to assume that you know large requirements will receive you know very aggressive data center pricing uh, but where we might have some imbalances as it relates to supply and timing on the market, mm. um, you know, there's there's uh, reasonable to assume that, that prices could go up, which, you know, I would say is the first time I've said that in a long time. Yeah. So I think that I mean, just music to many of the people on this call's <laughs> ears. Sure. So I think that's where, you know, the industry is right now. And and, um, you know, certainly if you're competing, I mean, these some of these, you know, requirements are the biggest we've ever seen. And so. Um, but, you know, as, as there's challenges with the supply and demand, if there are based on, you know, some of the stuff, um, you know, it's, it's reasonable to assume that lease pricing could increase. Yeah. And you mentioned timing just a second ago, and that, 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 that kind of ties back to the plan power number again, uh, about not, once again, not all plan power is created equal yes. specifically on our site. So sometimes plan power refers to land. Yep. And sometimes it refers to a shell. That's right. Without, you know, the IT infrastructure there. So talk about the different dynamics there with regards to the timing and the differences between markets. Yeah. So I think one of the things that we we look at is how much of the planned capacity is like within a like built shell itself. So obviously the the uh, mechanical electrical equipment has not been installed, but the shell is built, which helps with timing. And so, like, as an example, I just looked at four markets, you know, Dallas, 15 percent of planned capacity is in shell. Chicago 18.2, Hillsboro 11.1, Phoenix 5.6. Mm. So this is of the plan. This is a, that's a that's a percentage of what's in shell and what's um, you know Overall the total plan. plan. Yeah. Yes, but what it shows you is time. Like I go back to what I said at the very beginning. Timeline to development will be very important moving forward, and you know more important maybe than ever before, given some of the dynamics that we're seeing. Okay. Those uh, great thoughts, David, North America, Europe, APAC. Thank yeah. you. Uh, we will turn now to Q&A. Oh, my favorite. That is question and answer, if you yes. aren't familiar with that. Yes. All right. All right, let's take this one first. Is what are the differences in hyperscale data center users in the U.S. versus Europe versus APAC? Yeah, I think uh, it's it's really around maturity as it relates to their, like, infrastructure footprint. You know, because many of these bigger users, like, have come from the U.S., they, they have more of like a, a mature, like owned and leased footprint here in the U.S. And, and they're trying to establish that in other places. So I think that impacts how they are going about doing things in the market. You know, there, there are other markets internationally where they certainly have like owned footprints. Dublin is a good example. I mean, there's a massive amount of hyperscale owned facilities in that market. But there's also a, a maturity going on of like how to... Um, you know, have both that owned and leased campus structure, how to create availability zones in the most efficient manner. And that's what we're seeing play out. So, um, you know, I think the, the exciting thing is like, there's probably a lot of people on this call that are, that are right in the middle of, of that type of, of work. And I think it's going to go on for a while. All right. Next question. Will there ever be another market like Northern Virginia, specifically around size and growth? Well, that's a great question, Mike. Um, you know, that's hard to imagine. <laughs> will, there never, will there ever be another David Liggett? <laughs> no, they broke the, question, the mold. Yeah. They broke the mold the when they we made ask you, ourselves David. every day. No, I think, you know, if you think about Northern Virginia, um, it's just, it's, it's such a big data center market. There's been so much investment made uh, and it continues to grow. You know, it's not like it's, it's grown and it's, it's getting smaller. I mean, it continues to get bigger. So from that standpoint, hard to imagine. I will say that, 
you know, I think some of the demand size, because it's higher today than it was like five to 10 years ago, um, you know, I think you could see markets grow at like a similar rate or maybe even a higher rate because some of these large requirements look at smaller markets and see value because of things like, you know, reasonable power costs, subsea cables, tax incentives, all the things we, we know that make these requirements go. So, but it's, but it's hard to imagine that a market will ever surpass Northern Virginia. It is hard to imagine if you squint real closely. No, I'm just kidding. All right. What technological or techno technological, there we go, advancements could or would radically change the data center industry? Uh, there's a lot of thoughts around this topic. Um, and I, I'm sure people on our call would have, you know, a lot of ideas around this. I mean, my thoughts would be, um, you know, certainly what's happening with AI right now. I think the way businesses are using that to um, to change the way they operate. Um, you know, I think we, we've talked ad nauseum about autonomous vehicles, but that certainly is something that I think most people in the industry believe would have a massive impact on our space. Um, so there'd be a couple things that I would, I would mention that would, that could radically change the way our industry operates. Yeah. Anything about like, like power supply, renewable generation, battery, et cetera, anything around those things that you see maybe on the horizon? Yeah. I mean, I think that there's, question was from me, by the way, I appreciate that, that was not submitted. by that, you, I, I think there is a lot of capital being placed into, you know, finding efficiencies around cooling and efficiencies around, you know, uh, build and, and th that type of work. Um, and, but, but I think you've, you've seen some of those things, you know, play out. I mean, there's data center operators today that are, you know, able to do things from a cooling perspective that, you know, five years ago we couldn't do. I mean, there's things like liquid immersion cooling and things like that, that are being explored, I would say by some of the most sophisticated data center users, but typically those technologies or those, um, advancements, take a while to, you know, play out and for everyone to participate in. So yeah, it's I like think, a new iPhone where you get one every two years. And if in two years, everyone could have the new highest iPhone. Sure. Data center, the hardware horizon is a little bit longer. Yeah. Even bet. if it was the greatest technology ever, it would still take time. Yeah, you bet. All right. We got a question. Will 2022 hyperscale leasing be flat above below 2021 levels in North America? Any rights? Thank you. Very polite question asker. I appreciate that. That's the, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a great question. Um, you know, I really think it'll be um, either moderately below or equal to. I mean, I think that we're like like we said, a lot of our 2021 thoughts around market growth certainly had that baked in. And, and I think we all you know, we were surprised at how big 2020 got with everything that went on. Um, so, you know, I'd probably say we would be we'd be in the ballpark. OK. Uh, how do you see edge data center sites developing the next three to five years? Some analysts believe there'll be 500 to 1,000 edge data center sites coming soon. What is your take on this? Uh, there's a lot of capital being spent right now to... I would say define edge. Would be my, I would answer a question with a question, but sure. anyways, go ahead. You go sure. ahead. You know, I think there's a lot of capital being spent right now on thinking through how to best solve this, hmm. uh, which I give a lot of credit to our industry. I think there's some, some companies that have really spent some time working through great strategies and in, in how to help this development take place. Um, hard to predict. I think for a while we've been talking about this growing amount of, of demand that will come. Um, but we haven't seen like the, I think it says 500 to a thousand edge data center sites. Haven't seen that yet. Uh, but I think there, there's certainly like use cases that could support this. Mm. So from that standpoint, I just, I don't think we will get there as quickly as we thought, even in the next three to five years. But it, it is something that I think, I think the money is well spent uh, on figuring it out because I do think it will be something to, uh, that, that will impact our space moving forward. All right, I wanna jump down a second here. What are the team's views about prospects of falling geographies, Malaysia and Batam, I'm gonna probably butcher that, and some around like Indo Indonesia and Indochina? Well, I mean, I think one of the, you know, any of these, like I would say like secondary international markets. If I was in the develop, data center development world, you know, you'd have to be looking at these because the, the, uh, the users have challenges in those markets that they're trying to meet. So it's just a question of like where you want to spend your money and how long does it take for, you know, that money to produce a return or those developers to produce a return. And some of those secondary markets from just 
a development standpoint, it just takes longer. Uh, there's less, they, they, they've done it less times, you know, so, uh, but I think if I'm looking to grow internationally, you know, that it's certainly, um, you know, less risky maybe to place capital in a market where there's a much bigger market. But I'd also say that there, there are groups looking in those secondary markets that would make me want to know certainly what the opportunities are there. Okay. All right. I'm going to ask this question, but I'm going to rephrase it as a soccer question. Do you like soccer? I'm sorry, football for our European audience. <laughs> if the North American market was a the European soccer league or the English soccer league, and there was a premier league, our primary markets, and there was like our, I don't know what the second one is called, champions, it's not champions, whatever is one below premier. Oh, uh, yes. Who, which market would be the first in line for promotion to the premier league? Hmm. So which secondary market do you think is growing to the point that you might even consider one of those primary markets? In the US. In the US. Yeah. North America. Don't yeah. limit it yourself. Thank you. You know, I'm actually glad you said that. I mean, one, I, th I think certainly would be Toronto. Mm. Uh, so Toronto is a, you know, a big data center market, but uh, there's a very tight real estate market there that's making, you know, development, uh, you know, more challenging than an area that it's not, that the real estate markets, you know, uh, you've got more available sites. So I think that certainly is an area where I would say, hey, that's moving up. Um, we mentioned Portland. I mean, that is an area I don't want to like overstate what's going on. But I think like two years ago, we were riding on why Port we thought Portland would grow the way it was. You and, called it. You, you know, called it. Hey, shoot your shot, that. buddy. I don't know about that. But, you know, dudes, dudes celebrating their W's. <laughs> I know. I think that that that's a market that I would, you know, look to to move up, um, you know, and but but I would say even in some of these bigger markets that have been a little quieter, there's more noise. Dallas is a good example. Mm -hmm. Chicago is a good example. Atlanta is a good example. So. Um, you know, maybe we would consider those already part of the primary group, though. I so agree. It's for groups that are trying to make the leap, yes, as it were. No, no, I agree. You know, and then and then you know the other market that, that comes to mind is a market like Columbus. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that market from a how much has been invested by some of those hyperscale companies. You have a much smaller co-location footprint, but I do think that is a market that uh, is really interesting. And you know, once we see another thing I just bring up is like when you see that initial those initial development dollars go into a market, gr those groups typically expand and grow. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and so I think Columbus is in a market that we'll see some of that. Okay. What are you hearing in the past few weeks about supply chain issues and delays to data center delivery timelines? Once again, thank you. <laughs> Same submitter. Uh, you know, I think that we we haven't heard that it has you know, slowed down development. I, th I think, um, you know, I think there's a global, you know, global supply chain uh, commentary being made just about the, the, the world markets in general. At least people that we've talked to, you know, been very like firm with, hey, you know, we, uh, I mean, the good news about like the data center industry supply chain is this was a topic before the pandemic, this was a topic for them of importance sure. before the pandemic was taking place. Well, and everybody's trying to do just in time delivery basically yes. and want to get things exactly when they need them. So there are always going to be risks when you have that setup. Right. And so this is just maybe exacerbated some of that, but I think the operators are, they have plans in place to mitigate those challenges. A hundred percent. I mean, like I said, this was being talked about far before the challenges with the pandemic were going on. So, um, so we really haven't heard, you know, that there's been any type of, of issues, um, you know, and I think that, you know, there, there, there could be down the road, but I think that's, you know, to be seen, um, you know, at least the, the pro projects that we track and all those type of things um, that we're doing to make sure that we're tracking the inventory, like things have continued to deliver at the rates that, that, uh, you know, we think they should have. So. All right. Here's an interesting right, one. Mike, what do we got? Uh, do you think the industry specifically retail oriented providers with flat rate power pricing uh, will be able to successfully push cost increases through to customers if electricity prices remain elevated? How do you see that dynamic playing out? And I would say just so most, if people aren't aware, so a lot of times like a larger size lease will have a plus E on the end. At least you see the statistics we publish on our site say plus E, which means you pay for the electricity that you actually use. Uh, at the smaller end, you know, maybe like sub 10 cabinets, sub 20 cabinets, typically that's included in the cost and the, the operators won't, won't go through the trouble to meter every rack. Yeah. And so it, when power price is going up, which we see, and you mentioned earlier, yeah. How is that going to play out on the retail side? Well, I mean, I think that, um, you know, those costs, I mean, they have to be allocated. Some, someone is paying for them. So, uh, you know, I think a short-term fix would be that, 
you know you you could keep a flat power rate but we've, we've seen some of that take place in other areas that have you know had to be fixed from like a PUE standpoint I mean you can take a flat PUE but there's still cost and you know the, the the elevated PUE's levels and someone is paying for it so at some point I would say that might work for a short period of time but you know it can't work forever all right, Abel, that is all the questions we've got for today. Okay. Uh, anything else, final closing thoughts? No, I'd just like to say, I mean, I know you're going to say thank you, but I also want to say thanks to everybody that has joined. And, you know, thank you for your support of Data Center Hawk. We're, you know, so thankful for it. We continue to look for opportunities to, to do some of these live LinkedIn's. Uh, we also have some that are uh, recorded as well through our stuff, and there's plenty of Data Center Hawk content if you want it. Uh, but I just want to say personally how much I appreciate you know, those that have supported what we're doing and, and are behind us, whether customers or, or just friends in the industry. Uh, thank you and look forward to uh, getting to connect again soon. Yeah, absolutely. That was a lot of fun. Uh, again, thanks for joining. Always check out datacenterhawk.com for more information uh, and stay tuned for the Q3 blog with some of the topics we covered today, plus maybe some bonus content. Oh my gosh. All right. Thanks again. Thanks. We'll see you next time.